Check, check, check. What are you teaching? What's that? What are you teaching today? Uh, well, we're talking about working on wealth. Are you joining us? No, I'm working on a listing. I gotta finish it. Okay, well, we're gonna be teaching a class in here. So I, uh, uh, there's other drop-in space over there if you want some quiet time. I gotta finish this and my computer battery just died. Oh man. Tell me your name again. David. David, that's right. That's right. I'm kind of intrigued to see what you have to say. Uh, what, do you have a specific uh, thoughts that you follow? Or is it, uh, we're going to be following a lot of the millionaire real estate investor. Okay. Um, but we're also, uh, we're also going to be tapping into uh, a little bit of uh, Ben Kinney. Do you know Ben Kinney? The, uh, one of the top agents in Keller Williams, you know, uh, he has a, he's a huge agent. He, he, he's a uh, creator of Rivity, the, the CRM. No, I'm not. I'm not familiar with him. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, he has a, a, a group called Win, Make, Get. It's a podcast. And there's a really great uh, plan for building wealth through there. We might tap into that. Uh, Gary Keller and Jay and Pappas, they have the podcast, Think Like a, Think like a CEO. I, uh, I listen to them. Okay, cool. So season five is all about building wealth. Season five. Mm -hmm. It's funny because season five is very much like the MRI book. And then the, the last thing that we might tap into is a book called The Psychology of Money. Um, oh, in the Think Like a CEO podcast, they, uh, Gary interviews the author of that book in one of the in one of the episodes. Do you, do you actually only focus on real estate? Or do you do no, it's it's gonna it's gonna be um, a wider range than just real estate. In fact, the the MRI book, which is probably what we're gonna be following like the most closely through, um, it's funny because it's it's you, you you look at the cover and you think, oh, this is the book on real estate investing, and it is, but it also covers a lot of other things on top of it: personal finance. Uh, goal setting, all that kind of things. Uh, I'm trying to get a, a, somebody from Kohler Law Firm to talk to us about forming corporations, S corps, that kind of stuff. At, at what point does it make sense? Like, where, where does your income need to be at for that to, to, for that to uh, start making uh, making sense? Um, so yeah, there's a there's a bunch of stuff that, that we may be covering. Um. I might have someone come and talk to us about estate planning at one point. And I do have extensive training on all of the stuff. Even this stuff is a CFP. No, no, I am not certified. I oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I did. No, I, I went through all those training and estate planning. Oh well then yeah yeah but your your interest changed so much yeah it's unbelievable things it's not it's not the same yeah <laughs> well your 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 experience and knowledge will be entirely welcome so yeah well, you know I'm just feel free feel free to chime in uh, uh, how this relates to what I know because sometimes you know you have five numbers for the <laughs> Would be the sixth number. Yeah. So I'm just trying to find that sixth number to see what uh, could help me. There's so many things that we know, but there's a lot more that we don't know. Hey, Miguel, welcome, welcome. Hey, hey, what's going on, friends? How you guys doing? Doing well. I'll turn my All volume. Right. 
looking forward to some, uh, some good info here. Right on. Fantastic. I must say, yesterday when I was at the webinar, mm -hmm. it sounded a little low from this side. You can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have that problem today a little bit because I need to keep my I need to keep the sound running on on my laptop. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to hear it when I run the video that we're going to listen to today. Um, all right, guys. We'll get started here in just a minute. We'll see if we have other people drifting in. Started here and just uh, give me. One more minute, we'll start. Eric Bailey, did you see Eric? Yeah, uh, Max Scherzer pitching for the Dodgers last night. Okay. Universe, I had a, uh, I had a bad trade, uh, trade day. I lost nine clubs. Oh yeah, that's great. I, I almost texted you during at the deadline. Chris Bryant is a giant. I know. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with Javi Baez going to the Mets. Okay, with Kimbrough, uh, Kimbrough going to the White Sox. I'm just not okay with Anthony Rizzo going to the Yankees. Oh, that, that's a tough one. That, that, that's a, that's, that's, a, tough a, that's one. a tough one. But if you notice, he still wears his Chicago, uh, his uh, old time Chicago Cubs cleats and batting gloves. Uh, all right. All right, guys, welcome, welcome. Let's, let's get this started. Hold on. You know, I've never heard that song before. What was that? that that's uh, Pink Floyd's Money. I'm kidding. <laughs> written, in, written in 7 8 time, by the way. Uh, surely you must be pulling my chain with a guitar hanging on your, on your uh, back wall there. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the few songs that was. Uh, a top 40 song that's written in a weird time signature. It's seven, eight. I never thought about that. That's interesting. Right on. All right, guys. Welcome, welcome to Working on Wealth. So to be clear, this is going to be a series. We're going to do this uh, once a week. Um, I hope you join us. And uh, my, so uh, I've been wanting to teach this for, for years. My concept is I want it to be kind of a, a study group where we, where we, 
journey together, learn all about finances and improve our own uh, knowledge of wealth, our own habits, which are far more important with health, with wealth. And uh, yeah, um, uh, as, as source material, we're gonna be probably following the MREI book most closely. Uh, uh, if you don't know the MREI book, here, I'll show it to you guys. There you go. Here, here's the MREI book. You haven't seen it. It's like the MREA, but blue. And um, surprisingly, it's not really a book just about real estate investing. It's a book also about personal finance. It's almost even a little bit philosophical when it talks about just building wealth and what is wealth and all that kind of thing, right? Um, in addition to the MREI book, we're probably also going to be poking around in the Think like, a, uh, Think like a CEO podcast, specifically season five, where Gary Keller and Jay Papazan talk a lot about finances in general and that kind of thing. We may also jump in through some uh, Ben Kinney, if you guys don't know who that is, creator of Brivity, the CRM, also, uh, I believe, Keller Williams' number one agent, like literally the number one agent at KW. Uh, he has a podcast, him and, and Chad Hyams have a podcast called uh, Win, Make, Give, I believe it's called. Uh, and that also is a, a podcast that has a corresponding website and there's like workbooks that we can use, all that kind of stuff. So it's gonna, th this, this class is gonna be a lot of class participation, hopefully. Uh, and it's gonna be one that I, I encourage you guys to like participate in. If you guys ever wanna come down here to KW South Bay in Torrance and come join us in person, totally cool too. Um, uh, Zoom is fine as well, but that, that just to have an idea of kind of like what the, what the framework is. Now, why am I, I'll, I'll tell you why I am uniquely qualified to teach this class. Uh, I am uniquely qualified to teach this class. Uh, let's see. So out of college, I fell into Silicon Valley working in, in uh, I, I started as a web designer, got into sales, got into product management. Uh, made a ridiculous amount of money in stock options and, and salary and bonuses and stuff, blew through that. Uh, my wife inherited almost a million dollars, blew through that. Uh, later on, uh, we were living on the East Coast, had a, a real estate team, we were making tons of money. By that time, I was a little bit wiser. We didn't blow through that. It was more, and we started accumulating properties. I, I flipped over a dozen properties. Uh, I, uh, we started accumulating a real estate empire. And uh, when 2008 hit, we got kind of, there was something that were kind of, uh, we were leveraged a little bit too much. Not, not bad though. We were, we were by that point a bit smarter. And, but, but really uh, we got hit in a really unfortunate circumstance. Both of our kids had serious medical, uh, uh, not serious life-threatening, serious as in like costed a whole lot of money kind of thing. And uh, the, the way the insurance was back then, when, uh, was, we had just gotten to, to, to Carolina. So like our finances weren't like, we didn't have good insurance and didn't even know it. Uh, so we got hit really hard and it just wiped us out. So uh, I have probably gained and lost more fortunes than most. Uh, there's probably others who, I mean, I'm not unique in that, in that realm, but I, I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. I've, I, I, I'm not a certified financial planner. Uh, it's funny, David here in the in the office is uh, uh, I believe qualified, right? You say you, you have your through the education and the training. Yeah, so he, he's a great one to, to have here in our in our group. Uh, again, think of this as like a study group, right? Um, so we're going to start with this. I, I've got some questions here for you. You might want to. Eh, you don't really need to write them down. You can if you want, but this is more uh, just to kind of get you to realize what this class is about. Question number one, if you or your family got hit with a $500 medical bill today, could you handle it? Question number two, what if that was $1,000? Number three, $5,000. What if you had a $5,000 medical bill? Could, could you handle it? Would, it? would it, like how big of an impact would that make? Which by the way, is not all that uncommon, right? I can, by the way, I can sp speak from experience. It can get way worse than that. Um, question four, do you know what your monthly expenses are? Business and personal, 
right? Do you have a prudent reserve? If so, how many months of prudent reserve do you have? And that, and that goes for business and personal. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, as you guys know, as real estate agents, it's, it's very challenging to, to kind of get a handle on what budgeting looks like. Because I, I don't know if I came from a salary world before real estate. And so I was used to just getting a paycheck and I always just knew that was coming. So no matter what, like my expenses were covered and the rest was just all play money and fun money as far as I was concerned, which is another very stupid way of thinking about that. Um, but as a real estate agent, you know, even when you're doing well, you may have three months where you have zero income, like not, and no, it, that, that would be a, that would be a blessing, not just zero income. You may have zero, uh, zero income and a whole lot of expenses on top of it, business and personal. Right. Uh, and by the way, I have sweat more than anybody. You know, I know what it's like to be up at three o'clock in the morning, staring at the ceiling, wondering how you're going to pay rent. So uh, I've got that experience too. Um, do you have a separate business account? Do you keep your business and personal finances separate? Do you have a will set up for when you die? And we're all gonna die at some point, right? Do you have a will? Do you have an estate planned? You know, have you thought about what happens the, the day should you have an unfortunate thing and, and you know, pass away earlier than you, than you had hoped for, right? Is your family gonna be taken care of? Do you own real estate? Okay, some of these questions are gonna get, might make you feel uncomfortable. Do you have credit card debt? Any installment debt? Student loan debt? Car loan? We'll talk about the future a little bit. Do you have enough money or a plan to pay for your kids' higher education or, or secondary education, whatever? Whatever your kids' plans are, are you, are you gonna be able to help fund some of that? Do you want to? Do you have enough money to take care of your parents or, or do they have enough money to take care of themselves as they get older? Do you have money set aside for retirement? Are you properly insured, right? And let's talk about that quickly here. That's car insurance, homeowners, uh, disability insurance, right? Life insurance. Do you know what your business expenses are? When was the last time you looked at a P&L, at your P&L? Do you know what a PL is? Do you, do, you, do you know how to access that? Have you compared your PL with the KW budget model to see where you uh, might be overspending or underspending, which can also happen, by the way? Some more future planning stuff. Do you know how much income you would need to fund your big why, your, your, your purpose in life, what you want to accomplish before you die? Do you, Whatever it is that you want to do, do you have enough money to fund all that? Maybe there's vacations you'd like to take, experiences you'd like to have, homes you'd like to own, right? Do you have any other income streams besides just your real estate? That could be uh, real estate investing, could be stocks and bonds, could be some passive income stream, such as ding, 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 profit share, right? That's something we can all take part in. And then one last question for you guys. Has this questionnaire made you feel un at all uncomfortable? I'll tell you, you know, I'm in much better financial shape than I was five years ago, 10 years ago. And yet as I do this, like, like even as I'm just teaching this class, I'm like, you know, my palms are a little sweaty. Like it, it's definitely not the most comfortable topic for me. So I hope you guys get that. Any, any questions right off the bat? I, let, me, let me ask you this. Is there any, it, what would you like to get out of this study group as I call it? Anybody want to talk about that, David? Yeah, I'd like, I, I think the, the basics are really good to review like what you're pointing at. Also, I want to try to figure out if there's a strategic way to accumulate wealth and obviously there's many avenues for that, but leveraging real estate, that's all. Absolutely, so we're definitely gonna cover a lot of real estate investing specifically. 
because uh, we're going to go through the MREI book. I don't know if we're going to like go through it chapter by chapter or maybe skip around a little bit where I'm kind of like still ironing out that a little bit, but we're definitely going to spend a lot of time in the MREI book. There's a lot obviously about real estate investing and they're they very much have a plan on doing uh, Gary and Jay have a plan on accumulating wealth. And so does Ben Kinney. And they're, as you can imagine, very similar, but there are some differences. So we may cover them at different points or whatnot. Great question. Thanks, David. Anybody else? We're talking about what you would like to get out of this. I'll also encourage you guys, if you're available and not everybody is, but if you can, feel free to, uh, to put your uh, video on so that we can all do it. I mean, it's a pretty small group, so you can, you know, if, unless you have a lot of background noise, you can even leave it off mute. It's not a big deal. Um, all right, so here's what I've got for today. Uh, this is a great place for us to start. And, it, and back to that questionnaire, Wherever you're at, and, and sadly, I, 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 I did not think that this class was gonna be very packed at all. So I'm actually surprised that we got, what we got 10 people here? Because most people who need, need to hear this the most, avoid this the most. I can tell you if, you had, if this class was uh, offered in my market center five years ago, I would have made sure, absolutely sure to not even be present in the office while that class was happening. Like I didn't, I did not like looking at finances or anything. I just knew I made a lot of money and that was my that was my whole financial plan. I just make a lot of money, and just don't stop doing that. Uh, a, a very stressful, poor way of, of handling finances, I might add. Um, okay, so here's here we go. Let's let's start here. This is from today. We're going to watch this video. This is really cool. It's going to be a while, and we're going to stop it periodically to uh, to kind of take comments and whatnot and see where everybody's at. But this is really cool. Uh, it's posted on KW Connect, although very few people know about this. This is, wait, hold on, let me, let me do that again. Share screen. Hey everybody, welcome, and, and I'm always super excited, but I'm really excited about this. We're gonna have a conversation about wealth. Now, don't get scared, don't run away, don't turn it off, and yes, you are in the right place. You too deserve wealth, and you deserve to be- By the way, a quick thumbs up, can you guys hear it okay? Audio? Awesome, thank you. Able to teach wealth. I wouldn't presume to do that alone. I have Jay with me today, thank you for being here. Oh, I love this topic. It's one of my passion topics. My wife and I teach this like once a month, whether anyone's there or not. Like we have a investor group and we talk about this. This, the collection of wealth and the collection of money really has been the preoccupation of so many people's lives. The challenge is many of those people don't know the fundamental rules to money. And so what happens is, and we're gonna get into this, they end up working with very little to show for it over a long body of work. And we can help people avoid that. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna have a conversation where we're gonna give you the genesis of how all of this started, the path on how we got here, and we're gonna to try to prove out some of these concepts to you. The goal of this video is to make sure, number one, you understand why this discussion is so important. Number two, you come to terms with the fact that there are specific rules about money, and once you know them and follow them, you can have as much of it as you want. And number three, we're gonna lead you into the next video where Jay and I are gonna tell you some of the words that we use to move people into action faster with us than without us when it comes to growing wealth. So let's get into this. You and Gary started this quest to better understand money together, but it wasn't last week. When did you guys get really interested in this? So the, the ultimate genesis, this illustration came from the Millionaire Real Estate Investor. The Millionaire Real Estate Investor came from one of our final interviews for the Millionaire Real Estate Agent, which would have been in 2002, Christina Martinez, the most successful person we interviewed who only worked with investors. Okay. Gary's like, well, wow, our people should all be investors. And so we went down the journey to write Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Um, for about a year and a half, pretty much all I did was read investing books and I'm an English French major, right? <laughs> so this was a journey and I interviewed, I got the privilege of interviewing 120 millionaires. And these were people that had a net worth of over a million and it could prove it by showing us the equity in the properties they own. So they were real estate millionaires. Sure. And we were looking for patterns just the way Gary does. So you had to have had preconceived notions about wealth and about money going into it. Yes. And I know how you are. You went into it with curiosity. Did your ideas change over the course of those interviews? Totally, um, massively. 
you know, just working for Gary and being a part of Keller Williams, when I joined the company, one of our stated goals was 5,000 millionaires. Mm. This was a huge part of it. It was why we had profit share and these other things, right? It was a big part of the conversation, but it was alien to me because like most people, nobody talks about money. There's no class in it at high school. And unless you study finance, which is not the rules of how you make money, that's about accounting. No one teaches you this stuff. Right. And so I went into those interviews with my dad and executive, and I'm thinking the way to get rich, I didn't even know what wealth meant, was to do a great job, work somewhere and be faithful, become a high paid executive, right? And then earn a high income. When most people think about wealth and money, they think about income, Jason. Sure. Yeah. They don't understand that the definition of wealth is something different. And that was what I came to understand. Well, I've heard that term, Henry, high income, not rich yet. The, the challenge is, though, that so few people actually get rich. And you and Gary are always looking for models. And, and I want to get into this one in a second. But two questions come to mind right off the bat. Sure. The model is one page. And yet you just said it succinctly. I spent a year reading books about wealth. Mm -hmm. So how can there be volumes and volumes written about wealth and we come up with a one-page model? Um, I think people overcomplicate it. That's one of the reasons we're all afraid is that you watch CNBC and you hear about stock options and all of this, and it feels like another language, and it is. Sure. And I will tell you that a lot of people that get their MBAs and you're talking about business, you may have run into them. They want to talk about EBITDA and all that stuff. I kind of think it's a power play. I'm just like, <laughs> okay, talk to me about cash flow, yeah. right? You can keep it really simple, and if you can understand it on a simple level, then you can do complex things with it. And you know, this is Gary's gift. How do you take a really big, complex idea and make it simple? And it starts with definition. So we both, we've both we talked about wealth and we've talked about riches. Sure. And Gary defined in the opening pages of the Millionaire Real Estate Investor, and this has been a big thing. This is why we talk about this. Financial wealth is having the passive income, not the earned income, the passive income to fund your life mission without having to work. It doesn't mean you don't, ha you don't want to work. But that means you have passive income. So that's how we define wealth. And you get that by owning assets that give you passive income, which is very different than getting a job, like I thought, and trying to get a six-figure salary. Massively different, but there's, there's two thoughts there. Number one, we have to move from active to passive, which we're going to get into. But number two, you have to be able to define the life that you actually want to live. Oh, well, yeah. We just find success as getting what you want in the one thing. And we had no idea that most people haven't really thought about what they want. Well, so, and this isn't a get out of jail free card for not having gobs and gobs of money. It is to say that having gobs and gobs of money, if you don't know what you want to do with it, we don't really think you're going to be any happier. Well, let's just do this. I think in our industry, the, the, the great way when we get to the conversations around it, we have a lot of people who are competitive and they're competing on production numbers. And the thing is, if you know what the passive income you need is to fund your mission in life, you actually know what the goalpost is. Sure. Most people are always moving the goalpost forward, yeah. right? Oh, I made a, uh, I netted a half million dollars this year. And instead of celebrating and thinking, wow, that might be it, they're looking to how do I net a million or two million? And I love achievement, but they don't have any sense of where the finish line is. And that is one of the things we can help people do. I'll never forget, I was sitting with a mega agent and I was trying to, to be impressive right off the bat because I was recruiting and you always want to be impressive. <laughs> and so I said, you know, my team sold blank number of houses. And she said, that's really interesting. And I said, well, how about your volume in production? And she said, three. <laughs> and I knew full well this was someone who sold more homes than I did. And I said, well, what do you mean three? And she said, oh, I count my years by how many homes I own free and clear at the end of it. Oh, I love it. I love and, it. Oh my gosh. I mean to tell you, break script, but I have told that story to so many other real estate agents, which immediately is a pattern interrupt. And now we're thinking about wealth differently. Yes. So, Very important. Let me, let, let's get into this because he, he, here's the general consensus from every team leader and OP that I've talked to that doesn't feel wealthy yet. Mm -hmm. I feel a little fraudulent talking about wealth. Or I run from the wealth conversation because I don't want to be looked at as a fraud. Or this person knows that I'm not rich yet, so I don't want to talk about it. Or this person makes more money than I do. So how can I talk to them about wealth? Um, one, I think if we can internalize some very simple concepts, and I think we can also be transparent. Say, I'm on the journey to two. We, very few people get opportunities to have conversations about money. Mm. And very early in our wealth building journey, we started hosting millionaire meals, millionaire mochas, millionaire margaritas, you say it. And I was surprised at people like, oh, we actually get to
By the way, I'm considering uh, moving this class and calling it Millionaire Margaritas. Just, just uh, keep that in mind. That's something we, we could do if we want to. Okay. Talk about money, and they were excited. Yeah. So first off, it, most people get to talk about this. Mm. So they won't be resistant to say, are you curious? Would you like to learn more? I am too, let's do it together. You do not have to be an expert. Just like to teach someone the principles of the millionaire real estate agent, do you have to have been one? No. No, you just have to understand the models. So, and then we go on the journey together. And, we, and Yeah, and we stuck with kind of the general idea, right? As the theme for all of these videos has been, if you can use simple pencil drawings to explain complex ideas, people move closer to you emotionally. That's exactly what we did here. Usually I would just be writing this and you all would be sending the emails that you can't read it. So we decided to print <laughs> it out so that you could. But this is written in such a way where you can pull out a yellow legal pad and a green marker and you can draw this for somebody. And while you're doing it, you will be giving them the keys to unlock the mysteries that they've never really understood, which is simply how money works. Because to me, Jay, this looks like a giant Planko board and it falls down. And I was so confused about money. I thought there was so many things you can do with it. Explain how this works and clarify it. Well, first off, I love that you just evoked the image of the little marble going down on a Planko board. Okay, that's great, because that is how this it. works. No, that's how this works. So let's just start at the top. You have two kinds of capital, human capital and capital assets. Fancy words for you're working for money or your money's working for you. And we're gonna get back to that. But when we talk about financial wealth, Financial wealth is how we move from I'm working to my money's working for me. Okay. When enough of my money is working for me that I don't have to work anymore, I'm financially free. Mm. And that feels really good. And I'll tell you when we think about big whys, so when you ask someone, why do you wanna be a millionaire? Why do you wanna be financially wealthy? Almost every answer comes down to two things. It's not stuff, it's not even experiences. They want either financial security because they grew up without a lot, and what they want to avoid is being afraid of not having it, mm. or they want freedom to choose to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, with whom they want, for as long as they want. Yes. Right? It's that idea of freedom to choose. And those are the fundamental drivers for why someone is willing to move from here to here. This gives you cash flow, not EBITDA, no fancy, it's cash flow. It's just okay? cash. Right, we work in real estate. That's what we get from a real estate property, is simple language. And you have four choices. I, this is the part that always blows me away. Okay. And because when you explained this and then you defied me to try to think of a fifth, I, I couldn't. This no, is it. This is, I mean, Gary did a great job. There's four buckets. Most people spend their most time on number one, spend it. Yeah. And because of that, they never get to the other ones. But you can spend it and you can hold it. And we say hold it. This is like savings. So, on, so in the freezer, under the mattress, in a right. bank, same thing. Right. And if you're holding money, um, the real truth there is you have cash and it's available for emergencies, but it's probably not growing, mm -hmm. right? Your average bank account savings is going to pay you like less than a percentage in interest. And we know that that's not even a fight inflation. So it's but actually shrinking every day. Every day. But there's a reason you have it. Because if the air conditioner breaks, you don't want to put that on a credit card, sure. right? If you have to go to the doctor, you've got some emergency funds, just like we do for our business folks. You can then donate it. We Hopefully you tithe, maybe you do more, you're yeah. gonna to give to charity. Oh, and right? you guys are so great at that. Thank you for everything you're doing for KW Cares. Keller Williams agents do that in a big way. And KW Kids can. That is like, that is our strength zone, a part of our culture. And the last one, and this is the one that nobody wants to talk about because they don't understand it, is you can invest money. Well, the simplicity of getting to this point is everyone understands spend it, we all know what save it means, and we're all good at donating it. That's it. And so this is the only mystery on the board. Right, and people get confused about what it means to invest. They'll say, hey, Jason, I went and there was a deal and I invested in a great couch. Okay. What they meant is they got value, but they spent their money. Okay. Right? Because the couch is not an asset. It's not going to go up in value over time and it's not going to give them cash flow. It might give them cash flow if you look under the cushions and you find a few quarters, but that's it. Okay. Okay. You're just spending money. Yeah. But you only, when you invest money, you expect a return. Sure a financial return, and you only, this is where I love it. Well, so that's the simple definition for me. So if I'm confused on what investing is, it's that I'm expecting a financial return. Yes. I get to decide what that return is, and I get to decide what risk I'm willing to take, which is usually in proportion to what return I'm gonna gain. Absolutely. 
And that's where we, when we get to profit share and the risk quotient and the return quotient, that's where that conversation blows up. But someone has to understand it in context. Now, I promise you, we're not just trying to trick you into learning about profit share. We would never do that to you because it's not the most powerful <laughs> investment vehicle ever. I promise. All right. So there's basically two things you do with money when you invest it. You're either lending money to someone who thinks they can make more money with it. And so they're going to pay you for the opportunity to hold your money or you can own something with it. Okay. And then there's two styles for lending and owning. You can do it passively or you can do it actively. This is it, man. The, 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 so it, it's four choices. It's like a matrix. Am I going to own or am I going to lend? Am I going to do it passive or am I going to do it active? Okay. So let's talk about passive lending. A money market, a CD, a bond, or a treasury bill, though. Most of those, you're loaning money to an institution mm -hmm. passively, right? You don't have any, like, you just have a little piece of paper you sign, you give them the money, and they're going to pay you what kinds of rates of return. Because the bank's not going to call me and ask me to help them invest it for them. They're not going to ask my take on it. They're going to do all the work. Totally passive. They just want your money. Got it. And like with a CD, they want it for like 10 years, yeah. right? It has to wait a long time. So it's totally passive and it's lending. That's the lowest rates of return. Okay. You can also own stuff passively. If I own stock in Apple, I passively own Apple. Yeah, they're not calling you to ask about the new feature for the iPhone. No, no, no. And there's no amount of iPhones I could ever buy that will raise that stock. Right. Not on a personal level. Unless I'm an executive in that company, I can't influence that investment. So I'm along for the ride. It is a passive investment. You also, for whatever it's worth, you really don't know what's actually going on in that company's boardrooms. <laughs> Once a quarter, you get, if you're willing to read the statements, you get something which is often kind of arcane and hard to understand anyway. Sure. Um, a real estate investment trust, a REIT. You can passively own real estate. Yeah. Right. Hey, I want you to invest in real estate. You can do that passively as well by owning these funds that own lots of commercial buildings or whatever it is. And also mutual funds is that as well. And traditionally, what has the stock market yielded? What do people, most people say? The, 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 the rule of 10, right? I'm going to double my money every 10 years if things go well in the stock market. Which is going to be around 7%, but it's 8 to 10 is what I often hear. Historically, the stock market will yield. So even on the low end, 7%, that's a lot better than lending passively. Sure. Right? Now you can own. This is where we want to build wealth. You can build some wealth in owning stocks, especially if you're an insider and you have a lot of money to invest. Where you get to active lending and owning, which is the world we live in, by the way, we have a tremendous advantage here. This is where the huge rates of return are. So active lending is like owner financing. I own my house free and clear. I'm going to offer you financing. Why is that better than like a passive loan? Why do you think? Well, I definitely understand it more. And I get to be involved in picking who I'm going to give it to. Right. And I Which is think, kind of work. And I got to think I'm going to be able to charge more for my money. Exactly. So you get the charge above interest rates because you are now off the books lender. Mm -hmm. And what happens if they default? I get the asset back. You're the bank. I'm the bank. And in this country, the bank seems to always win. They, send, they do <laughs> tend to win. So there is even upside in the downside because you have a small job in it. And I've seen people easily get in the, you know, on the low end, 7 to 10%, but on the high end, you can get 12 and in different times, 15% on hard money loans. Sure. Right? And private lending's where that is. Okay. So some people can go in and you can do convertible notes. There's all kinds of crazy things, but I'm going to actively lend money because I've saved some and you didn't. You needed to take advantage of an opportunity. I might get equity for that or I might get cash flow. The simplicity of that, which is I saved some and you didn't. That's it. If we, if we had Jamie Dimon here, right at Chase, here. Ba Chase Bank would be saying the same thing. Yeah. We have it and you want to borrow it. Right. They played the game of spending it and hopefully donating it. They didn't hold any and they didn't invest any in a place that they could pull it back out again. So they need your help. And because of that, you get a nice rate of return. Got it. The final way, and this is where the most money is made, the most wealth is built, is the active ownership of businesses and the active ownership of real estate. I'll tell you, we own about, Whoa, I think. Wait a second, because it, hearing that, I kind of get excited as a real estate agent because on day one, I owned my business. Yes. And I was also a homeowner on that day. So you're saying just by the mere nature of me joining and owning my house, I was already playing on that side of the game? You got it. What we know is homeowners, not even investors who own their own homes, their net worth is on average 35 times that of a renter. I, you say you got to hear this again. Say that one more time. So on average, the net worth of a homeowner, this is not even an investor. This is someone who's just owning a home over someone who's renting. Their net worth is 35 times higher. 
This is so vitally important for you to take out and go tell everyone you can. This is the essence of how residential real estate agents change the world. If you're passionate about changing a community, go make a bunch of those people's realtors because leasing a part of America is great, but owning a piece of America is where you can literally start making a difference in your life. You got it. And I look at, we own about nine rental properties, my wife and I, over the years, we've acquired them, right? And I look at those and I expect them to get a rate of return of between 18 and 24%. And that's in Austin, Texas, where cash flow, yeah, it is, but it's active ownership of real estate. And you mentioned this earlier. There's a thing, this is like special treat, like sidebar in a book, the rule of 72. You heard of this? Mm. So this is a great formula. The rule of 72, if something's growing at an interest rate of 10%, divide 10% into 72, 10 into 72, Mm -hmm. it's about seven. Sure. It'll take seven years at 10% for your money to double. There it is. Right? And so if you go from 7% to 14%, how many years is it going to take? Well, you short circuit the whole system. You've cut it in in half, half. right? Right. And now your money's doubling in twice, in half the amount of time. And that's how things get big really fast. That's why we care about the rate of return. The higher the rate of return, the faster our money doubles, it grows faster, and we build wealth faster. Right. If you're doing trying to become a millionaire in treasury bonds, you better have invested millions to begin with. Sure. Or that's kind of the Methuselah method. Right. It's going to take you a few hundred years to get there. <laughs> right. Because the, the, it's just the return is too small. But ownership of business. How much money do you know the story? How much money did Gary borrow early in the years of Keller Williams to finance this company? Forty thousand dollars. I'd heard sixty. So let's give it either one. <laughs> it gets it's better every on time. On the high end. What is the rate of return on that money? You think? Oh, I can't even fathom. It's infinite. Yeah. It's infinite, right? Effectively, he borrowed none. Right. Right. And most of you who own a real estate business, you bootstrapped it. You've got zero dollars invested other than your time and your rate of return is infinite. And here's the scary thing. When I ask people to fill out a net worth sheet, which is a lot like a a, a loan, right? For a mortgage. What are my assets? What are my liabilities? Many real estate agents, and this is our opportunity, they never list their own real estate business as an asset. You, you just said a bunch of things. And, and the one, I'm gonna go back to the most basic of all. You said, when I ask people to fill out a net worth statement, break script, ask yourself right now, pull out your pen if you're taking notes, how many people in the last 60 days have you asked to fill out a net worth statement? I, I haven't asked any. Jay, who are you asking to do that and why? Everyone who's in my world that is willing to be my mentee on that, That's the question I ask them. If you're willing to do that and be transparent, what I know is this. We have a group of about 40 people in our work, this world, that meet once a month. And the only requirement, they don't have to buy houses or anything, is that they're willing to share their net worth publicly once a month. On average, and we've tracked this for almost three years now, their net worth grows by about 4% a month. Their aggregate net worth. Yes, and these are people that have school debt, they have all of these things, but because they're tracking the right number, What is the total amount of my, you subtract my liabilities, my debt from my assets, right? Which is what I own. What's that final number? It forces you to get really smart. So it's one of those singular things. It is the one thing for wealth building. Your habit is you track your net worth. So anyway, that is where it, it grows fast. This is where the income grows fast. And this is where financial returns comes up to capital assets. The more money we invest here, the faster we get to passive income. And there's something out there, it's called the 4% rule. Okay. And traditionally, people will tell you, if you've got a million dollars, what's 4% of that? But that's like, now you start working backwards. The easier way to do it is, I wanna have $100,000 in income passively. You can also multiply that times 25. That's how much money you would have to have. And at 4%, theoretically, and there's a lot of research around this, you can pull 4% off of that every single year for over 50 years and not run out of money. Gosh, and then- So that's see. the magic number. Like you're thinking you're in retire, maybe I'm gonna live to 125. <laughs> maybe you Do will. I have enough, right, to have 4% of that fund my life mission forever? That gives us a target, right? So you can either use the 4% rule, if you can do that math, I need a calculator. Right. Or say, what's the number? I wanna have a half million, great. Multiply that times 25 and let's go build a plan. 
we come at, I want, I want to summarize this, right? Because it's easy to get lost, but the conversation can be as short as one minute, which is we're either working for money or our money is working for us. Either way, that's going to produce cash. We then only have four things to do with it. We can spend it, donate it, hold it, or investment, which is what everyone's confused about. With investing it, we're either lending or we're owning. It's either passive or active. And if I want to make the most, I'm going to be in the real estate business and I'm going to buy real estate. You got it. Now then, all of that money goes back to the top and this entire Planko board of life starts over again. You got it. And, and, and because we understand this world, and it doesn't take long to understand it, right? We all start at zero because who teaches you about real estate investing when you're a kid? Nobody. Nobody. Right? But we can do this. We work it out. We know what things lease for. We know what things are, their value is. We know what they're worth after we improve them. We have a massive advantage in that. It's very accessible for us. So we can actually start setting goals. Yes. around how much passive income we want to create from this. So all the conversations that we've been having, whether it comes to org chart or it comes to 30, 30, 40, or it becomes expansion or India or, or, or you name it, they're all focusing on people's business. Mm -hmm. We want to give them a bigger business so that ultimately they can have more money to live a bigger life. The first time I saw this drawing is when that statement became clear to me. Because hmm. truthfully, I've been saying that statement forever. We want to help you build a big business so you can build a big life. But I didn't really know what it meant. And then I saw this, hmm. which was the big business makes this return greater, which then ultimately comes back up here. And then I get to choose what my big life is. I can go spend all of it. And by the way, I make no judgment on the person that does it. No, I can go out and I can hold it. I can donate it or I can invest it. This is the manifestation of the dream of why we build these big businesses. So the, here's the missing piece. We told them this wasn't a talk about profit share, but how does profit share fit into this? I, I'll tell you how I got to the conversation, which was, Gary, you explained all this to me. Mm -hmm. And when you got to the, he, you, you were much kinder than, than he was. When he got to this site, he said, so how much do you think you're going to get over here? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, well, take a guess. And I said, I don't know, two or 4% these right. days. He goes, cool, 2%. So that means to make $20,000 a year passive, you're going to need a million bucks. And you got to take that million bucks and you got to put it over here. And then you can't look at it, touch it, talk about it, or do anything with it. Do you have your million? No. <laughs> and, but I didn't want to say that. I was like, yeah, may, I, may, let's ask me a different question. But no, I didn't have the million dollars. As a matter of fact, and I hate to admit it, I didn't have very much at all at that time, but no one wants to say that to the person they're trying to impress. Right. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking, Gary just spent with Jay a half hour explaining a game that I'm not going to be able to participate in. And that's when you started talking about profit share. And the beautiful thing about profit share in the world that we live in and the company we work for is you can shortcut this process. Mm. You don't have to have any cash flow to participate in profit share. That's the key. That's no the cash point. invested at all. It's a little bit of human capital. Am I willing to build relationships with people? Am I willing to refer them to my team leader and then follow that process, right? I don't have to be a recruiter. I don't even have to learn a whole lot of skills. Right. But I've interviewed at least four people this year that already for how I built this, and I know in Wealth Building Wednesdays, we have a lot of people that in as short as five years are getting 20,000 or more in profit share. Which means you'd have to have a million dollars if you were playing the game that everybody else is playing. You see, that's the part about being in Keller Williams that not enough of our agents really grasp, was that, yeah, sure, we have the opportunity to go build these giant businesses, and we're the home of systems and models and technology and people, and all that is great but we also have a passive opportunity to create more generational wealth than any other firm has ever had. I know, and it's, it's like a part of my mission now to help people do this, and I know that you're passionate about it too, but I'll just bottom line it. When you make money and when you're coaching people who are making money, the thing that we want them to do is not spend so much that they can't invest any, hmm. and we want them to be investing in their business and investing in real estate, and the other thing they can do is make sure that it, one of their activities is building their profit share. Yeah. And then let time do the trick. Because the magic thing on all of these is time. And we've seen it in the profit share tree. So why is profit share? Okay, we'll, we'll, st we'll stop it there. They're, they keep talking about profit share for off. If, if you want, you can go and check that out. Um, but uh, that whole first part, talking about the path of money, which is also uh, one of the... Uh, uh, on the podcast, the Think Like a CEO, it's one of one of the episodes is all about the path of money. And in fact, I believe at family reunion this past year, they, they uh, let me just stop sharing here. At family reunion, uh, Jay and Gary did a whole episode, which was very similar to all of this. Um, 
So having seen that, any ahas, what do you guys think? What lessons learned? Pretty cool, right? That, by the way, that, uh, give me a second here. I'm going to say, I have that, let me save this. I'll share it here. If any guys want that diagram, I'm going to put it here in the chat bar. Hold on a second here. So that figure comes from the MRI book. And by the way, I wanna stress something here. One of the things that people don't realize that the MRI teaches is for us real estates, they give you all the tools, including some of like the marketing material you would need if you want to start teaching investor seminars. So once you know all, this, all these concepts that we're doing here, you can go and teach uh, financial, uh, you know, teach some financial uh, investing and whatnot to, to people you know, and be a resource for people, which is one more, one more value that you can provide to your clients and, uh, and your business. Any other questions we have? Any lessons learned? Hey, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Miguel. You have mentioned uh, REITs, uh, real estate investment. Are those the same thing as notes? Note investing? I do not believe so. So real estate investment trust is, is almost like a mutual fund for, in, for real estate, sort of. It's a, it's a conglomerate of people putting their money together for, for real estate. That's, that's my understanding of it. So like when somebody syndicate, if someone does a syndication deal, you would be part of that. That's in the, that. Cor correct. Yeah. David, do you, do you, uh, uh, definition of a real estate investment trust, an, a REIT. Basically is the trust is created by, by, by an organization that invests into the real estate. Uh, that could be most in the uh, arena. So that's what they invest into. And uh, one of the growth that portfolio has and the income that has, it goes to the shareholders. And that, and that comes in a variety of uh, 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 versions. Uh, some are traded on the stock market uh, as a mutual fund. And there are so many ways of getting grits. And there are some just uh, basically you have to be a credit investor in order to get that. Depends on what you want to do and how much investment you want to do. So there are so many variety of those, but in general, it's investing into real estate, and the owners of the trust, which would be the investors, will share will share the benefit of the capital gains and the income of that. But you're uh, but you're a passive owner, right? You're you're not you're not, you're not doing anything at all. Yeah, you're not choosing the real estate. You're not managing it anyway. You you it's a it's a passive income. You can't. You can't affect personally the outcome because you're you're not involved, right? Um, unlike when uh, unlike uh, when we purchase real estate, you know, individually, that's that's a whole different game because you you're it's an that's that becomes an active income. I will tell you, one of the things that I've heard along, in fact, it's funny. I've I've heard this quote from about five or five to ten different times throughout my real estate career, and I've always heard it from people that I really admire a lot. And this is really curious. They've all these people that I admire a lot. They say, uh, as much money as I and, and we're talking like mega producers. They say, as much money as I've made with my real estate business, uh, I've made a whole lot more real estate investing. And they say, and if you do things right, that should be the path that you follow too. Uh, so I, I've I've always thought that was really fascinating, uh, and I've heard that, like I said, ten times from people I really admire. So. Um, any other questions, uh, lessons learned? Why don't we do this for, for next week? We're going to go over the millionaire real estate investor. And if you've got a copy of that book, let's do, uh, for next week, we're going to do, it's not really the first chapter. It's called overview. It goes from page 15 to page 34. And, uh, it's just a few lessons learned before we, after that, we're going to start diving into some actual like nitty gritty, uh, you know, workbooks and homework. The other thing that I would recommend, uh, 
now you guys all seem like you're a little more savvy than what I was expecting. But um, because I, I will tell you, uh, you know, I was a coach for a couple of years and I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've been in the business for a long time. I will tell you, most real estate agents, their finances and their business finances are a complete mess. And they just, they just deposit and hope that they withdraw slower than at the rate that they deposit it. I mean, that's literally, the, and most, most, most agents don't even have a separate business account. I mean, and, and, if, and if that's you, if that's one, one, somebody on this call, start where you are, start where you are. Like, there's no shame in that. Let, like, let's, let's, you know, we're all starting where we're starting. You're, the fact that you're here is you're already miles ahead of where you were yesterday if, if your finances are a mess, right? Because you're now in the solution and we're going to start working our way, chipping away at it. So here's a couple of suggestions. Here's when I was a coach for a couple of years, a real estate coach, this is what I would tell people when they were like, oh my God, my finances is a mess. And I would say, well, here's my quick five-step plan on how to get your, real, your business finances cleaned up. And so what I would recommend is listen to my five steps and wherever it is the step that you haven't taken yet, see if you can take this next step this week. Number one, get a, a bank account for your business. Doesn't have to be fancy. You just go into your bank and just say, I would like a separate account for my business. And they'll walk you through it. Doesn't have to. Now, if you want, you can have it named after whatever, you know, have a separate name for it, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't even have to be a business account. They don't need to know that it's for your business. All that matters, that, there's no reason legally that it has to be a business account. All you need is a, is a separate account for your business. Something that you can write checks out of deposit. Hopefully something with a debit card would be great. Um, just something you can use for your business. So there's number one, get a business, business, a business account. If you haven't done that, see if you can do that this week. Number two, start using your business account. So if you have an expense and it's business related, run it through your business account. If you have a deposit that's business related, run it through your business account. Now that's, that may seem silly. You're like, well, why would I deposit a, you know, I, got, I, I just got a $10,000 commission check. Why do I need to deposit in my, in my business account and then immediately write myself a check or transfer 10, the, the same $10,000 over to your, your personal account? Trust me when I say this, this will make your life a thousand times easier months from now as you get more and more clean. Just for now, just know. And, and I know everybody's got a question. Okay, well, what about like, if I go out to dinner, is that a business expense or, you know, just do your best to figure, you know, to take a guess, whatever it is, like your cell phone, probably a business expense, your car. If you, if it's a car for that you use mostly for a business, I like to route that all through my business account. Um, entertainment expenses. If it's related to business, sure. Go through your business account. Just use your judgment as best you can. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if you route, if you get that 80% right, down the road, as your business grows, when it comes time to do taxes and accounting, whatever you're doing, your life will be a thousand times easier. So step number two is start using your business account. Step number three, get some form of financial accounting software. Uh, you could just use regular Quicken. You can use QuickBooks is probably the most common and, and probably the most powerful way to like, that's, that's kind of the industry standard amongst real estate agents is using QuickBooks. You don't have to. There's other ones out there. I'm not. I'm not here pushing any particular product, um, but I am. A, I'm. A, uh, I am a big fan of QuickBooks. Okay, that was step number three. Step number four is you're going to have to do it once, and it takes about a couple hours. Uh, and this, some of this corresponds to being able to use the Keller Williams budget model, where we take uh, real estate expenses and put them into categories, and that way you can see versus the benchmarks out there of what the top agents are doing and uh, see how, you, how your expenses compare to them, right? So that, that's the end goal. So step number four is a one-time thing that only takes a couple hours. Could take you as quick as a half hour if you're savvy, maybe three hours if you're particularly not computer literate, but shouldn't take longer than that. The MREI book, so let me share my screen here. I'm gonna show you guys something real quick. There is a corresponding website. And by the way, this is true for all of, oh, hold on a second here. It's going to take me a minute. Okay. 
All of Keller Williams books has a corresponding website. It's called Keller Inc. Keller, K-E-L-L-E-R-I-N-K, not I-N-C. It's I-N-K, like an inkwell. And here's a picture of it here. Here's the website. If you go here under, so that you can order all the books, of course, here's all the Keller Williams books. You probably didn't even realize that there was this many, um, but there are. Uh, but if you go underneath resources, and then you go under millionaire real estate investor, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, um, no, millionaire real estate agent. By the way, there's a bunch of stuff that we're gonna be using here for MREI, but for MREA, the agent book, there is chart, you'll see down here, it says chart of accounts, XLS, chart of accounts, Excel spreadsheet. Go ahead and download that. And then when you open it, it's gonna have a chart of all the different accounts. Uh, and go ahead and line those all up in QuickBooks. Maybe it's some, maybe next week I'll, if you guys have trouble with this, I can show you that. Uh, you want to you want to up set up all your categories for your business in QuickBooks so that they correspond with the categories in MREA. That is step number four. And please note, there is no miscellaneous category. Everything has a home. Okay. So once you've got step four, that is upload set up all your QuickBooks so it corresponds to the MREA chart of accounts. And then step five is as you're putting your, your, uh, uh, putting your uh, expenses, logging stuff into QuickBooks, use not only, you know, log it in, but use the, uh, use the, the account. And that way, later on, once you have that, by the way, once you have step number two down, which is you get a business account and you start using it, everything else you can, you can, uh, you can do later on. You, you can have an account and go do it for you. You can hire someone to do it. But, but what, once you get to that point, you're, you're now at least most of the way there. So step number five is you, 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 you start entering in your expenses and chart them to the account so that that way you could very, I mean, once you're there, the rest of it's really fun. And kind, I mean, I don't know, I find it kind of interesting. So like I recommend once a month doing a PL sheet and seeing how you compare, uh, you know, making sure every, there's nothing on there that's crazy that you weren't expecting, you know. Go, you know, reconcile your accounts, uh, go to your checkbook, make sure every, you know, your checking account, make sure everything's logged in. Um, a lot of places you can just download it straight into QuickBooks and just make sure everything's matched up with whatever expense it corresponds. And then about once a quarter, I take that P&L for the quarter and I match it up against the KW budget model. And I see how are my expenses comparing against the, the model? Uh, Cause that's, that's the goal is we want to be able to, to, one of KW's four models, well, now there's five, but uh, the, the fourth model, the, the third model is the budget model where you take your expenses, you match them up against. That is a super, super powerful tool to use on occasion. It's gonna let you know, it's gonna kind of guide your business. Like you'll see really quickly, oh my God, I'm spending 40% on, on marketing. Probably you need to cut that back. That's, that's, you're, that's way too much. Um, or, on the flip side, you're like, oh my God, I'm making enough money now that this actually says I have enough money that I should be spending $50,000 on salaries, but I don't have anybody. Huh? Well, maybe it's time for you to start thinking about hiring an assistant. That's one of the ways that you know it's time to hire it. It's funny, at the beginning of class, I was telling you guys a bit of my history and I have a very tumultuous history with money. So when I started making a lot of money as an agent, I had a coach and my coach was like, Hey, you know, you're busy enough and you're making enough money. You, you need to start thinking about hiring an assistant. And I was like, I'm not hiring anybody. I'm, I'm, I want to keep every penny. Like I, you know, I, I'm too scared. I, I don't, I'm afraid that this could all end tomorrow and I'm going to have an assistant who's looking to me and I'm, you know, but he was like, Ed, you know, you've got prudent reserve and here's your income. Like the model says you're now ready. Like they're, there's no reason why you should not, and you're, and you're busy enough that you really need one at this point. Um, so that's, what, that's an example. I only say this as an example of how doing the budget model helps, helps you, the CEO with your CEO hat on, helps you make business decisions. Does that make sense? Anybody have a, qu a question about my five-step uh, get your business finances uh, under control? Uh, pretty straightforward, right? Is that any comment here? 
uh, if you consider this as your business, this will be your scorecard. It will tell you exactly how you did quarterly or yearly. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what the score is, how do you know that you won? You don't know unless you have a scoreboard. You know what you did and you have all the numbers right in front of you that will tell you, hey, this is what you did and this is what you need to adjust. This is what you need to do. And it's just, an, it's just a, like a beacon that will basically give you information of what to do and where to go and where you've been and where you need to go. That was very well said. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, and again, we're not going to be talking that much about our business finances, but that is, you know, anything that's financial related that corresponds to realtor, I feel like is fair game for our little study group here. Um, okay, let me do something else too. Let me give all of you guys my contact information. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, I am the director of growth at Keller Williams South Bay. Is there anything that you'd like to see us work through as a group? If there's any, any comments, concerns, like this is a, a very, I'd like this to be a somewhat informal, like, you know, collaborative study group, like I described it. Uh, so if you have things like, oh, you know, we, I would love it if we checked out this book or I would, uh, um, can you, you know, if you have question or whatever, uh, a resource, maybe you know a CPA and you're like, oh my God, I have this awesome CPA. Can we have them present to our class and talk to us about tax saving strategies or whatever? Like, you know, it's all fair game. So if you got suggestions, let me know. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully, I'll, hopefully I haven't scared you away. I, I'm, this is a good sign. We have uh, almost as many people finishing up the class as we started. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, no one got scared away when we, when we started talking about some financial stuff. Um, and, I, and I commend all of you for being here because this is not a topic people oftentimes like to talk about. I know myself, like... Uh, it's not my first choice of most fun topic, but I make myself do it because I know that whenever I do it and I have more clarity on where my money's coming and going and, and that it feels extremely rewarding to me to do it. And, uh, but it still does not come you know, very natural to me. Um, so there you go. Any, any, any uh, comments, concerns, questions? Quick question, Ed. Yes, go ahead, uh, Miguel, and then, and then David. As far as the time for the classes, are, are we looking at like we, <clears throat> three to four each week or will the times vary sometimes? Uh, three to four each week. Although if everybody tells me like, hey, can we do this other time? Because that will work better. Uh, as long as it's in the afternoon, we can take a vote on it and move it if everybody wants to do it. Um, you know, or if most people want to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm open to suggestion. Uh, I wanted to make sure we were after uh, uh, Caravan, which is on down here in the South Bay and goes from on Thursdays, 12 to two usually. Uh, so that's part of what what motive made you know chose this time. But uh, if yeah, if anybody has a suggestion on wanting time to move, let me know. Good stuff. Was that helpful? Was that good? Everyone gets get something out of it. Yeah, it's funny how something that could be so dear, dearly important to us, we can build emotional resistance around it. It's like it's it's like you're talking about having emotional dysregulation, thinking about it. It's like, well, what's more important is, is the ability to make us really happy. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, so true. Like, and it's so funny our, as a country, like as a country, as a people, just and maybe it's, maybe it's everywhere. Maybe it's not an American thing, but uh, our relationship to money, you get people who all they want to talk about is money, like 24 seven. And that's all like, you, you know, they're, kind of boring because like that's all they want to they don't have a life that's all they want to talk about is what their latest investment was or they want to tell you like their latest thing and then everybody else is like i feel like doesn't want to talk about it at all but i feel like you know i want to talk about it some you know i want to i want to be smart about it i don't want it to define my life i don't think i don't think money is you know uh the the what defines people um I don't think money is the most important thing in the world, but it's definitely part of the equation. And most of the things that do require that are important, a lot of them have price tags that are that are attached to them. So you you know, if you want to you know if you want to feed the world, there's probably going to have you know you're probably going to have to raise some money to do so. If you're going to want to whatever uh, put out fires in California and stop climate change, you're probably going to need to raise some money. There's a lot of you know uh, 
uh, money is a vehicle and, and when you got your head on straight, you're, you know, you can do a lot of great things with it. So. Yeah. Ed, real if quick. you don't have the book, just, just, just go online and order, order the, probably the coil bound. Sure. Either, either version oh, is yeah. fine. Any version of the uh, millionaire real estate investor is fine. I will tell you guys a secret. If you stop by Keller Williams South Bay, we have a stack of them here that is just sitting there that no one like you could take one and no one would ever notice it. Um, so okay. there you go. Oh, uh, I was going to add, I think you, um, you touched on something that's a, a, a gaping hole in our education system and yes. in that money is never talked about. It's never taught, not even at the college level, unless you look into it yourself. And it's such an important, it, it's why we go to college and, you know, it, it, it's, it's so important to our lives. It, it's amazing how, how lacking our education system is in general when it comes to learning a ba even the basics about money, assets and liabilities. Yeah. Miguel, that is such an awesome point. I'll tell you this really quickly. Like when I was about 38 years old, uh, I didn't know the first, like I was so ignorant about all this stuff. And someone, someone gave me a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read it and I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> just, phew, it just blew my mind. And I just kept thinking like, why did I not ever, no one had ever mentioned any of this stuff to me. It was just, just, just not anything I ever even remotely knew about. Uh, Keller Williams, Gary Keller, you know, Gary Keller felt kind of had a similar experience in that he, he like you're saying, Miguel, he noticed there was a, a, a gaping hole in our education system with regards to money. The class that he teaches called Quantum Leap, which by the way, is available to you as an agent. It's also, but he also teaches QL for kids or something like that. I forget what the title is, but that's Quantum Leap for, for, for children. Uh, not just like young kids, but uh, teenagers and, and uh, kids in their young 20s to teach them all about finances and money and how that all works and funding your dream and you know all that kind of stuff. So that, um, I took Q, uh, Quantum Leap, oh, I've taken it a couple of times now. Wonderful class, I highly recommend it. Um, you go check, if go to KW Connect and find it. Uh, it's not, you know, I'm not qualified to teach it, but uh, 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 I, re I highly recommend it. So yeah, and, and you, if you have kids or no kids who, uh, at that age, you know, I know when my kids are old enough, I can't wait to put them in that class. And, and by the way, I try to teach, I try to talk to my kids more about finances than my parents ever did. There's a quick, quick add on to that is uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've recently started playing cash flow for kids with my, with my kids, the, the, the board game. Cause I, yeah, I saw quick. the uh, <laughs> LA, LA real estate investors group, they'll meet as adults and play cash flow, the cash flow board game. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. It seems like our education system was put together to make nice little workers that's, that, that stand in line and do their jobs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how this was, it was just never seen as being something kids should be taught. And I, I think part of that's just because, you know, parents were never like, no, this is not a topic that was really, uh, really sought after and, and, and kind of organized and thought like it's, it's only been in the last, you know, some decades that personal finance has been something that more and more people like want to know about for their own. So other than that, it's just been kind of like not really spoken about and just kind of passed down, you know, or, you know, orally from generation to generation. Well, it's kind of time yeah. to talk about it. That's yeah. What it is. It's something not to talk about because people, most people, they're not comfortable sharing their information and they think that their kids know, everybody else would know. Yeah. So that's why they don't share the information. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't want to talk about money because I don't want to, I don't want everyone to know how much, how little amount of money I have, or I don't want everyone to know how much, how much money I have, right? They're, they're, you can't win, right? There's no winning there. Like I, I either have too much money or I have too little. I, I want to find the person that's just the right amount of money that they're like, hey, everybody, I can now share with you guys. I have just the right amount of money. I can now tell all of you guys that, right? So uh, we're, we're going to try to dispel a lot of that taboo here and, and just kind of be open about it. All right, guys, let, let's wrap it up there. That was really fun hanging out with you guys. Uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, I didn't know if anyone would show up. I just know this is a topic that I want to dive into myself. And I was like, anybody want to join me for the ride? Come along. So uh, hopefully I'll see you guys here uh, this coming Thursday at, at three o'clock again. Next week, we're going to it's we're gonna get a little more technical as we go. Uh, next week, as I said, we're going to cover the, what do I call it? The, that first chapter of MREI overview. Overview is for next week. So if you, I, I recommend reading it before then so that we can just like talk about it and not have to like, you know, 
read through it or page through it in class. All right, guys. Um, see you all next week. Glad to see you all here. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Right, thanks a lot, Ed. Appreciate it. Everyone take care.